Good morning. I'm so glad that you decided to join me today. I hope and pray that this Bible study will be a blessing to you. We're in the third chapter of the book of Philippians. Matter of fact, we will be finishing the third chapter today, and then we'll spend about two weeks on the fourth chapter, and then we'll move on to our next study, which will be the uh, book of 1 John. But uh, in the meantime, here we are at a time where the Apostle Paul is getting to the very crux of his message, and it's a book about joy, but I want you to notice in verse 18, now we're going to back up and read 17 in a minute, but in verse 18 he says, I have told you before, and now I say this again with many tears, that many live as enemies of the cross of Jesus Christ. Uh, that is the key verse in today's lesson, that there are many who live as enemies of the cross of Jesus Christ. So in the middle of this book, Paul wanted to write a book from prison that was completely joyful, completely happy, teaching them how to rejoice in the midst of their suffering, and yet he said, I've got this one thing that sadly I have to tell you, that many people live as if they were enemies of the cross of Jesus Christ. Now, he was probably talking about the Judaizers that he was uh, speaking of earlier in the chapter. They believed in God. They even believed in Jesus Christ. But they believed that salvation came by works. Now, I've got to tell you that uh, from my vantage point, my life began to change drastically whenever I realized that salvation was of grace. Well, I know I grew up being taught that salvation was of grace, but I kept acting like it was of, of works. I better do this or, or I might not go to heaven. I better do that or, or God won't be pleased with me. And whenever I understood that my salvation was by grace, then my works could be out of love and out of appreciation for what God has done for me and out of my love for other people. You know, it turned my life around whenever I began to understand that my works were a privilege rather than a duty. My works were a privilege rather than a responsibility. And it just gave me much more joy. And here Paul is teaching us that even today. That his works as a follower of Jesus Christ put him in prison. And it was in that prison cell that he would say, I have learned in whatever state that I am in therewith to be content. Now, I want you to notice something about life. Uh, life is a matter of consequences, is it not? You know, we make this decision and there will be a consequence for it. We'll make another decision, there'll be another consequence for that. Uh, we can even take it back to the days that we were in school trying to make the grade. If you spent extra time studying, there would be a consequence for that. You would get a few more answers right on the test. Or if you failed to study, there would be a consequence for that. There would be a few less correct answers on the test. And you know, that, that might not sound like much given the one test, but whenever you do a lifestyle of just trying to get by, whenever you go through a lifestyle of trying to sell yourself short, you find out that after a while, that you were paying pretty high consequences as a result of that. So think about what it will be if we continue to sell grace and the cross of Jesus Christ short. That is the theme of the lesson today. I want to remind you that even Jesus made the statement in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. He says, Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of, he of heaven. Only he who does the will of the Father who is in heaven. So notice that. Jesus says, not every religious person that says Jesus is Lord 
Not every religious person that calls out to him and says, Lord, not everyone will enter the kingdom of heaven. You know, it's one thing to say that Jesus is your Lord, but it's another thing to live for him and to prove that Jesus is your love, uh, your Lord. We're not getting to heaven by the words we say. We're getting to heaven by the, uh, the steps that we take to make sure that our calling and our election is sure, and then to live a life of service to Jesus. That's a part of the commitment whenever we come to Christ as our Lord and Savior today. So the title of today's lesson <clears throat> is Living in the Future Tense. You know, there are people today who live in their past. There's an item of their past that they can never get over. And so they live in that past. And that item that they can't get over, it's not always a bad thing. You know, there are some people who are unhappy today because they can't live in the glory days of their past. And then there are some people today who can't seem to get happy because of something bad that happened in the years gone by. Well, then there are other people who say, you know what, I'm living today for today. As if today was all there was to life. But the truly happy person trusts Jesus Christ with his tomorrow. We look ahead to the tomorrow that Jesus has in store for us, and, and many times that will help direct the steps that we take today. Uh, in chapter 3 in the book of Philippians, if you will remember, in the first 11 verses, I think it was, uh, he speaks as if he were an accountant. And so he learned new values. And so he's teaching us new values. And then in last week's lesson, uh, verses uh, 12, I think, through 16, he speaks more like an athlete and how we are running the, the race, we're striving, we're pressing on to lay hold of those things that Jesus laid hold of for us. And then today, we're talking about being an alien. So right now, we are a foreigner here on earth because if we are Christians, our home, our citizenship is in heaven. And we're gonna read about that right now. Beginning in verse 17, if you're following with me, the scripture says, join with others in following my example. So notice, Paul is, say, is saying, do what the others have done in following my example. Now, he sounds egotistical there. He sounds as if uh, he is saying, hey, if you're going to make it to heaven, you got to at least do what I do. But we've got to remember that we have the benefit of the Holy Word of God today. None of the people there had a copy of any kind of scriptures. And so the only way they could learn how to do things was to follow someone's example. Uh, there's another passage of scripture where he has shared that follow me according to the way that I have followed Jesus. And so Paul is wanting to make it clear to us that uh, Jesus has trained him. Jesus struck him down on the road to Damascus, and that was where he found salvation. Jesus told him he would be a minister, an evangelist, a missionary to the Gentiles, and that's exactly what he is even doing here, even though he is in a Roman prison. He is ministering to Gentile people and telling them the good news about Jesus. So he's saying, follow my example. I believe I've already shared this story, but it's worth sharing again. There was an evangelist by the name of Billy Hanks. Uh, I got to meet Billy Hanks three or four times personally. Uh, he was a fantastic man of God. Well, he was holding a crusade in Africa, and uh, there with a missionary there, one day the missionary said to him, Billy, how about tomorrow night after our church service, let's go hunt crocodiles. Well, Billy Hanks thought, I've never hunted crocodile before. This will be a fun, good experience for me. And he said they hopped in this vehicle and it had a, uh, 
a big airboat on the back of it and, and uh, they were traveling and pretty soon the city lights were all gone and the only light they had was the, the light of the night. And finally they came to this swampy ground and, and backed the boat up into the water and the boat uh, wasn't even tied to the trailer. Whenever they backed the boat up into the water, the boat just eased on out into that uh, murky water. And so he got his uh, provisions, he got a baseball bat, and he got a 22 rifle. And Billy Hanks was wondering about this missionary, he thought, thinking, well, what's the bat for? And he said, it's to hit the crocodile with whenever we pull him up on the, on the, uh, uh, through the line. And so he says, well, what's the rifle for? And he said, well, that's in case the bat doesn't work. So they were wading water in an area where they were going to go hunt crocodile. And Billy Hanks began having second thoughts. And so he said to the missionary, he said, how long have you been hunting crocodile? And the man said, about 18 years. And then he said, just walk where I walk. As Billy Hanks shared that story with the group where I was listening that day, uh, Billy said, I didn't tell him, well, I'll walk where I want to walk, thank you. You see, he followed his example. And, and in a very real way, these people had no instructions to go by. And all they could trust was the example of Paul. So again, join with others in following my example, brothers. And take note of those who live according to the pattern we gave you. Now verse 18, I've already read it before, but it says, For as I have told you before, and now say again, even with tears, that many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. And their glory is in their shame. Their mind is on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, he will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. I want you to hang on to verse 19 for a minute. I'm going to be coming back to that at the end of our lesson today. That happens to be my very favorite verse in all of the Bible. And I'm going to explain it to you in just a little while, why it's my favorite and why it speaks to me the way that it does. So, again, he makes this statement that many people live, many believers live as if they are enemies of the cross of Christ. Now notice that. He's talking about professing Christians. He's saying they're living because this book was written to believers. And so he's talking about people who at least profess Christianity. Now again, let me ask you the question. Will everyone who professes Christianity go to heaven? No. Will everyone who receives Christ in sincerity and does their best to live for him, will they go to heaven? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, there are some people who know that there is a God. And they know that this God has a plan. And they even know that some way or another that God has a plan that includes them. But unfortunately, there are some people who never completely surrender. They never get to the point that their plans include God. You see, they want God to save them, but they don't want to live for God. They don't want to live for Jesus. They don't want to walk with him. They just want to save their spiritual skin. And, and that's not commitment. That's not commitment at all. So uh, notice, while we cannot be sure, Warren Wiersbe writes these words, 
While we cannot be sure, it is likely that Philippians 3, 18 and 19 describes the Judaizers and their followers. Certainly, Paul was writing about the professed Christians and not people outside of the church. The Judaizers were the enemies of the cross of Christ in that they added the law of Moses to the work of redemption that Christ wrought on the cross. So in other words, they were making the law of Moses more important than grace. Now, think about the law of Moses for a moment. In the law of Moses, it says, thou shalt not kill. Well, is that still important today? Are we supposed to live by that law? Well, of course we are. But here again, it is not the law of knowing thou shalt not kill. That's not what redeems us. That's not what gets us to heaven. It is through the blood of Jesus Christ. It's whenever we commit ourselves to him and accept the forgiveness of our sins according to his sacrifice on the cross. That's what saves us. We don't, need, uh, we don't need any other law other than the ultimate law that Jesus gave. You know, uh, it was said uh, of him, said, Teacher, what is the greatest law in all of the scriptures? And Jesus actually quoted Deuteronomy 6.4. He said, Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Then he added something to it, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And he said, if you'll just do these two commandments, if you'll follow these two commandments, everything that was written in the law, everything that was written in the first five books of the Bible, and everything that was written by any of the prophets. So in essence, he summed up the whole Old Testament. He said, you can hang all of that on those two commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. So, uh, so here again, Judaizers were trying to add something to uh, uh, another requirement to salvation. It was as if grace was not enough. Let me read a little bit further. Uh, speaking of these Judaizers, Wearsby writes, their obedience to the Old Testament dietary laws would make a god out of their belly. And he references that again in one of his other letters in Colossians chapter 2. And he says their emphasis on circumcision would amount to glorying in that about which they ought to be ashamed. And so he says these men were not spiritually minded, they were earthly minded. They were holding on to earthly rituals and beliefs that God had given to Israel, and they were opposing, get this, they were opposing the heavenly blessings that a Christian has in Jesus Christ. You know, earlier in this study, I shared with you about how much abuse the word fellowship has taken in Christian circles. You know, uh, it's almost as if that fellowship, that the ultimate definition of fellowship is either having a potluck dinner at church or having a homemade ice cream social uh, uh, at somebody's house after church. Well, in a very similar way, the word spiritual has suffered a lot of abuse. You know, we say somebody who is spiritual is somebody who follows all of the laws and all of the regulations, somebody who dots every I and crosses every T. But really, the person who is spiritual is a person who follows God and serves others. They follow God because they love Him. They follow God because they want to be obedient to Him. They want to serve Him in every way and many times the way that God chooses to have them to serve is through serving others. Let's remember this. We are called Christians, and remember that term Christians, whenever it says in Acts chapter 11, verse 26, and they were called Christians first at Antioch, uh, those who called them Christians first, they were meaning it as an insult or a slur. 
but today we use it as a badge of honor, and, and, and rightly so. Rightly so. Whenever we look at somebody and we call them a Christian, it's because they are willing to be the hands and the feet of Jesus to someone else in need. That's the definition I like to use for a Christian today. So, you know, uh, one of the things that these Judaizers would do, and quite frankly, I have seen this happen uh, in, in some churches in my lifetime. Have you ever known of individuals who pray to God in such a way that their prayer sounds as if they're trying to inform God of something that he already knows? You know, there have been times in my own life that I've found myself falling into that trap. And, and finally I come to the realization, God already knows all of that. You know, I'm not out praying, praying to try to help God or to inform God so that he can help somebody else. I'm to be praying to intercede for somebody else or praying for God to show me how I can be used to help that person in need. God already knows about the need. And if I'm going to be the godly spiritual man that God would have me to be, then I've got to quit informing God about things that he already knows, and I have to start showing God my willingness to serve him and to be his vessel and to be the hands and feet of his son Jesus until Jesus himself returns for me. That's what I'm supposed to be doing. D.L. Moody once uh, would use a phrase, and I remember the Oak Ridge Boys uh, uh, sang a song about it, but, uh, but D.L. Moody used to scold Christians for being so heavenly minded that they were of no earthly good. That when it came to their religious viewpoint, their spiritual viewpoint, they would talk about heaven. They would reflect about heaven and they would neglect the good that they needed to be doing on earth so that they could take others to heaven with them. So um, uh, D.L. Moody also, whenever he made the statement that, uh, I'm sorry, not D.L. Moody, but Paul, whenever he made the statement that these individuals were enemies of the cross of Christ. Um, one of the things that they did was that through these regulations, they thought that that's where the crown came from. So they would focus only on the crown and not the cross. And as Christians, right now, we have to follow the command of Jesus. He told us to take up our cross. And in one of the Gospels, it even specifies that we're to do so daily. So we are to take on, if necessary, the sufferings of Jesus Christ daily because right now we haven't received our crown. Right now, it's about the cross. Right now, it's about uh, uh, trusting the work of Jesus Christ in our lives and living for the glory that's ahead of us. Now, there are about four or five reasons that we're going to do all of this. And Paul addresses all of these in these short verses in one way or another. Uh, I'll just share the five with you just to begin with, and, and then we'll go through each of them uh, just for a short time individually. You know, as whenever we're thinking in the future tense, we are reminded that our names are written on heaven's record. That we speak heaven's language. We obey heaven's laws. We are loyal to heaven's cause. And we are looking for heaven's Lord. So that's the five thoughts that, that I want to leave you with in the uh, last half of this Bible study today. Uh, our names are on heaven's record. Now, why do I know that that's a part of this uh, passage in the Bible? In verse 20, it says, our citizenship is in heaven. 
our citizenship is in heaven. So our names are recorded in heaven. You know, citizenship is very important if you're traveling to another country. If you're traveling to another country, citizenship is very, very important. You know, I can remember some of the countries that I've been to, primarily Honduras. Uh, whenever you go there, uh, whenever I handed them my passport, i got to tell you, whenever you're going into a third world country, they always look at your passport and look at you as if they might not let you in. And you see, that's how important my passport is. It validates who I am, and it validates who I belong to or what country I come from. Now, my father-in-law, when he was alive, he had an interesting twist. He had an interesting twist on his theology. You know, uh, and, and I'm not so sure, I, I have a good idea he was right. But many times uh, in an old revival service, if somebody would come forward and receive Jesus Christ, uh, maybe sometimes someone would say, well, tonight his name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And that's not the way my father-in-law believed. You know, he believed that your name was written whenever God created you. And that our goal in life would be not to ever have our name blotted out. So you were created. You were God's workmanship. And it was God's desire, according to Ephesians 3.20, that through that workmanship, that you be perfected through Christ Jesus and his work on the cross. So God created you to live for him, gave you the choice to do so, and whenever you accepted Jesus as your Savior, you were perfected. So that being perfected, that kept your name from being blotted out. Now, Moses had not made heaven his home, but whenever uh, God was about to wipe out the Israelites because of their sins, Moses said, well, Lord, if you're going to do that, you know, please don't do that. But if you're going to do that, blot my name out also. So what purpose do you have for me? If you're going to do that, just blot my name out too. And, and so I, that was where my father-in-law uh, came up with that thought. So these Judaizers, they were enemies of the cross of Jesus Christ because they refused to look to the cross. They only looked to the crown ahead of the cross. And, and it is that cross uh, that perfects us. It is that shed blood of Jesus Christ that perfects us. Now, secondly, we're, our names are not only on heaven's record, but we speak heaven's language. I really like what the scripture says uh, in uh, Romans 9, I think it is, uh, 24, 9, 24, 9, 25, somewhere in there. Uh, no, I'm sorry, Romans 10, 9. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And I, I really like that. We speak heaven's language. Um, those who mind earthly things talk about earthly things. You see, the mouth, Jesus said, reveals what's truly in the heart. So we not only speak heaven's language, but we obey heaven's laws. So whenever we are citizens of the kingdom of God, then we talk like it and we live like it. We obey heaven's laws. And heaven's laws are that we operate our lives by the Spirit, not by the flesh. Now notice these Judaizers, they were living by the flesh. They believed that there were so many things that they had to do to get to heaven. They believed that one of those things, if you were a uh, male, they believed that you had to be circumcised. Uh, and they believed that you had to follow all of the dietary laws that were written for them to follow while they were in the wilderness. 
and, and, and so all of those dietary laws of the Old Testament, they believe that you still had to um, uh, follow all of that. And, and we read in about the middle of the book of Acts, somewhere around Acts 15, that through a vision that Peter received, that uh, those dietary laws were no longer necessary. And the church at Jerusalem, they settled that once and for all for us, and Luke recorded it for us in the book of Acts. And so that's another thing. And then we are loyal to heaven's cause. We are loyal to the cause. And uh, uh, if you notice, right now we're in a Bible study on Sunday mornings about building up the walls. And we want to build up the right kind of walls. We want to build up walls of purity. We want to build up walls of protection. We want to build up walls to where we are covered by God's grace. And, and we're studying in the book of Nehemiah on Sunday mornings. But here, these Judaizers, Jesus Christ had died on the cross. The veil in the temple was torn in two, meaning that we had direct access to God. And now these Judaizers, they were trying to rebuild that wall. They were trying to re that curtain. And they were trying to have some stipulations uh, to really being a Christian. And then finally, we are looking for heaven's Lord. Uh, I want to read one more thing to you from uh, Warren Wiersbe. Uh, he says, The Judaizers were living in the past tense, trying to get the Philippian believers to go back to Moses and the law. But true Christians live in the future tense, anticipating the return of their Savior. As the accountant in Philippians 3, 1 through 11, Paul discovered new values. As the athlete in Philippians 3, 12 through 16, he displayed new vigor. And now as an alien, he experiences a new vision. We look for the Savior. And then he says, there is tremendous energy in the present power of a future hope. I shared with you that my favorite Bible verse is Philippians chapter 3, uh, verse 21. Uh, I want you to notice, I, I like it best out of the King James Version because, um, well, in the King James Version, it doesn't sound like a pretty verse. And, and the language is really, really strong. And then I'll explain why it's my favorite verse, because it doesn't really look like a very pretty verse. But uh, uh, Paul writes, Who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Now, let me break that down who can take this vile body of mine and make it like the glorious body of Jesus? You know, whenever I learned, and I've been a pastor for some time before I learned this truth, but whenever I learned that it wasn't, Christianity wasn't jumping through a lot of hoops, that Christianity was surrendering this vile body of sin, and letting Jesus transform it. Again, it goes back to uh, trusting Jesus with my life so that whenever I serve him and work for him, I'm doing it out of privilege, not obligation. That it's a joy rather than a drudgery. Who shall change this vile body so that it can be fashioned like the body of Jesus? So that it can be perfected like the body of Jesus? And then it goes on to say that whereby, it says in the last uh, portion of the verse, it says, according to the working whereby, that he's able to subdue all things unto himself. So he's able to do the things that I never could do on my own. I couldn't save myself. I couldn't work my way to heaven. It was all through his work on the cross. It was all through his act of grace on our behalf. Uh, in Romans 5, 8, the Bible says, But God proved his love toward us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He did it all 
so that I could live for Him. Thank you so much for watching today. I hope you got a lot out of this Bible study here. God bless you.